One of my questions would be um, compared to the eight years fiscal austerity uh, facing Greece if it stays in the Eurozone, um, what would be the um, um, challenges facing Greece if it actually withdraw from the Eurozone? And um, um, to what extent does the Chinese economy play um, have a responsibility in the Euro, Eurozone crisis? Mm. I'll take the, uh, the second part first, which is, I mean, I think the Chinese, oh, there have been great sayings out of China on this. I think <laughs> one Chinese official said, do we look stupid? <laughs> no, none of you would buy these bonds. Why should we? <laughs> um, another one said, uh, you know, the Chinese need to, the, the Chinese won't invest into the Europeans essentially clean up their own houses first. Um, and I think that's essentially the line that China is taking, which is, yes, they want to see a stable world economy, but it, along with the U.S. and India, all of them have a united front ahead of the G20 finance ministers meeting in Mexico this weekend, which says the Europeans are rich enough to sort this out themselves. So until they do more, um, don't look to us to put in money. Because, I mean, and, and this is not just the kind of political issue. If you look at the Eurozone as a whole, its current account position is balanced. So the implication from that is that there's enough creditors and debtor countries within the Eurozone to actually uh, sort out its own liability. So in other words, if they had a huge current account deficit, then that would imply they would need the help of external creditors to sort out their problems. But given that all of the debt is internal, essentially, or at least the flows are internal, there's no reason why uh, they can't do more. But I think the problem there is that Germany is the only country that can do more, and its debt to GDP ratio is actually 81%. So it's not clear it can do more. So right now, um, the contribution that it's going to make to the temporary rescue fund would add eight percentage points of debt to their GDP uh, ratio. So they would bring it up to nearly 90%. So they were to up the cap on the rescue fund. That would actually bring their debt ratio up to over 90%. Germany can't afford it. So that's why it's unwilling to do that. And I think the solution there is actually really simple, but they rejected it on political grounds two years ago, which is why bother having a firewall in the first place? Countries which are in trouble go to the IMF. I mean, they decided they were going to solve it internally two years ago when Greece needed a rescue. And had they not decided that and just said, you need help, go to the IMF, then it wouldn't really be an issue because the IMF does have money, and its money is not real money. It's via SDRs, which are like quantitative easy. <laughs> so people just create money <laughs> and give it to the, the IMF, in which case the IMF always has enough money if it really you know, wanted to. So anyway, so that's my way of saying sort of it's not, much, it's, you know, it's not really the responsibility, I think, of you know, any particular country. At least the Chinese say they're willing to help. The US say we're definitely not helping. <laughs> Europe is rich enough. We're not giving more money to the IMF, and uh, no way. <laughs> um, yeah, they keep saying that, too, every other week, <laughs> just in case the Europeans didn't hear it the first time. <laughs> At least the Chinese say, well, consider it. Um, I was told that's because the Chinese are more polite, whereas the, you, the Americans are just like, no, no. Asking again? No. The answer is no. <laughs> um, okay, so on the first question about Greece, um, I mean, I think... For the Greeks, whether it stays in or out, it's going to have a period of conditionality where it's going to be monitored because, in a sense, it's borrowed a great deal of money from the international community and it's going to have IMF surveillance and Troika surveillance. If it's out, it'll be IMF surveillance. If it's in, it's Troika surveillance. Um, but arguably, if it were out, the surveillance from the IMF wouldn't be so intrusive as Troika surveillance, which is extremely micromanaging what it is that they do. Um, so, you know, the question for Greece really is just coming back to they need to have a conversation with its people, explain what it means to be in versus out. And they tried this by saying they would have a referendum about being in or out of the euro. But I don't think they really fully explained you know, what it would mean if they were out. And in fact, if they were out, and I, well, actually, if you, even if they stayed in, chances are Greece just needs a clean slate. And so in other words, it still has, after this debt forgiveness round, which is the biggest in history, it still has 100 billion euros of private debt. And they've just borrowed another 130 billion euros. So they've restructured 110, but they've just borrowed another 130 on top of the 109 they borrowed before. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so normally what would happen is if a country really can't sustain the debt load, you just, you would default. 
and you would have a clean slate. And then the IMF would supervise the country um, to have structural reforms to get back on its feet. I mean, to me, that's the ultimate position Greece probably has to be in. Um, but for to, to get from here to there, um, it's a long, it's, <laughs> I have, you know, I think Angela Merkel said the other day, oh, this crisis, it's going to be years before we're out of it. And everyone thought, oh my God, years, <laughs> years of covering this story. <laughs> Um, Monica Antonova, second year student. First of all, thank you, Dr. Yu, for the very interesting presentation and the interview afterwards. And now to my question. As a European studies student, I am also interested, unfortunately, in Europe, so sorry about that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my first question is, um, you mentioned, your, yeah, you already touched upon the whole um, we are family lack of spirit in Europe. Do you think that the whole no demos issue could be resolved by embarking on a federal path in a political sense and on a total economic integration path in an economic sense? And my second question, I'd like to put it in a more provocative way, would you recommend to European political leaders and to political leaders in general to read some work by Karl Marx called The Capital? Thank you. Uh, das Kapital, yeah, it's actually coming back into vogue. They, um, them, him and the uh, Hayek Austrians, <laughs> everybody's uh, picking them up. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't, I don't think that what's wrong with the way the euro uh, crisis has played out has to do with the kind of the, you know, the system of of how markets operate. It's actually the institutions. Um, so in that sense. If you're going to set up an optimal currency area, um, and this is a fallacy that lots of economists have had for a very long time. This was the reason why the Washington Consensus was so hated during its time, because this was the idea that you would unleash market forces. And it just didn't work for lots of countries, um, because they didn't have the institutions to support it. So for years, the IMF and the US Treasury went around telling developing countries to open their markets. But there was no institution supporting the opening. So what they generated instead was just a complete lack of any coherent you know, market in places from Africa to Latin America to Southeast Asia. So I think in that sense, when the euro was really conceived and set up, it was in that kind of framework. Economists didn't pay enough attention to institutions. So this OCA I'm talking about, there's no institution behind that, right? It's just trade integration and convergence. Um, but the reality is you need an institution to actually make and govern that kind of market. So I think there is a problem in terms of that kind of setup. Um, and as for whether or not euro, I mean, I actually think the eurozone is probably going to go down one of two paths. I mean, one is fiscal union, probably then political union. I don't know if it'll go as far as, you know, kind of a federal Europe, but I think this is clearly the path that they're going down. Or it goes the other way, which is to have a semi-breakup which is actually bond markets will probably impose the fiscal discipline now, um, in which case you just need to have the countries which really can't converge to be out because no one can afford to give them fiscal transfers. So therefore, the eurozone becomes smaller um, or becomes tighter. And actually, it could be both as well. And Greece would probably leave, in which case it would be slightly smaller, um, but then other countries will join, <laughs> you know, but then I think it'll be tighter. I think either way, it has to be, you know, has to, has to go down at least one of two paths. It just can't go on currently the way it is. Um, there's just no confidence um, in the euro. So. And of course, my big push is always give up the firewall. Stop talking about the EFSF and the ESM and combining or increasing the ceiling or leveraging it or... <laughs> creating special purpose vehicles for which the Chinese could put in seed money. Oh, just give up. <laughs> just go to the IMF if you have a problem. That's all countries. That's what the IMF is set up for. Um, but anyways, that has no traction whatsoever. <laughs> that's my one suggestion that nobody's ever going to take up. But I actually think that is the most sensible thing in terms of a crisis fighting tool, which is don't pretend you have money that you don't have. I mean, that's, you know. Hi, do you think that there's an economic argument for Scotland uh, leaving the EU, the e leaving the UK. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, well, that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm actually a strong believer in self-determination. So I think if enough Scots think that they don't want to be part of the UK, then it is about self-determination. Um, however, what I'm not so sure about is whether or not all of the institutions have been thought through. So for instance, what happens to the central bank? how much of a fiscal devolution 
you know, what is Devo Max in terms of, you know, how back, far back in history are you going to go? You know, that kind of issue. But in theory, self-determination. I think if the Scots want to be a separate country, um, it's already, a, you know, it's already devolved. But if it wants to be a separate country, you know, then I don't see an issue, you know, with that per se. I don't. Figures show that Greece economy accounts for 2% of the EU GDP, the whole output. And some economists say that because it's only 2%, so it's not going to have a big impact. But some economists say because we don't know for sure, it's better to protect it like the second bailout. So what do you think it'll, if there's no bailout, then what do you think will be the real impact? How much impact Greece will have, in your opinion? And um, I think the, the pro had Greece left, had Greece defaulted or left the Eurozone in May of 2010, um, I think probably it would have been devastating for banks, um, but possibly, you know, not really much of an issue. But now, because it's been tied up in two years about questioning the euros, the structure of the eurozone, that if Greece were to default or to leave, the reason, the contagion worry is much more about market perception. So does that mean that Portugal is not safe and then you get a massive sell-off? Does that mean Ireland's not safe, you get a massive sell-off? So the actual impact of Greece, even today, is probably pretty small. Most of the Greek debt is held internally. Um, it's only, its economy is shrinking, so it's probably less than 2% of, uh, you know, the EU GDP now. And if you just look at the CDSs, so this is what everybody worries about, triggering the CDSs. These are the credit default swaps. This is the insurance against default. This was the, what happened with the Lehman's um, collapse, where nobody worked out who held the CDSs. Actually, we do know about Greek CDSs. They're only 3.2 um, billion euros worth, and there's 4,200 contracts. So if we know the CDSs, and just today, the Greek parliaments announced the debt swap. And because they've put in a collective action clause that's retrospective, the debt swap, um, if it doesn't get enough participation, they're going to impose the losses on all the bondholders. That is a defect. That is, in effect, a credit event. It is a default event. It will trigger the CDSs. And Evangelos uh, Venezuela said in parliament yesterday, no one cares about the CDSs because they're so small. So they're going to do it anyways with the blessing of the Eurozone leaders. So now you don't care about the CDSs. Uh, you've recapitalized the banks to a large extent. The economy is very small. Um, how big would the impact of default be? Probably not that big, except had this happened two years ago, it probably wouldn't be that big. But now you're immediately investors um, or would be in risk you know, off mode, and they'll sell off fixed income instruments across the Eurozone. That's the worry. And they'll sell off banks because then they'll think the banks have exposure and are not properly capitalized. That's the problem. It's perception and the fact that banks are not properly capitalized because they have lost so much market share. And they've lost so much value in the last two years. They really will struggle to raise capital. Um, so, you know, so I think the problem now is much deeper than had they just kind of nipped it in the bud a couple of years ago. I'm Mateusz Szydamski, School of Economics Rep. Um, just to move away from Europe, finally. Um, I want to uh, talk more about China, given that, that China is going to lead the, the, the world's growth. So um, I recently read, read a report that the, the more and more Chinese companies are facing um, political problems for growth. So because of the amount of political surveillance they have within the organizational structure, uh, they'll be facing more and more problems with growth, and my question would be, is there a chance for political easing on the surveillance on companies in the future in China? Um, I think chances are they're going to have um, better, in the future, rights protection in China, because that's the trend. It's not, it's in a sense substituting legal reform for political reform, serious political reform. So there's been a lot of legal reform. So if you look at the way companies have benefited, private companies over the past decade, it's because they actually have limited liability protection for the first time. And they're given contracting protection for the first time. Individuals for the first time have actually a right to contract that they could go and sue in court with. Those are the kinds of things that have been done. Um, 
as opposed to having sort of you know political easing. And I think one of the big questions the Chinese have to face is they truly want multinational corporations, the kind that can lead them out of the middle income country trap and sustain more decades of growth, then they're going to have to allow these companies to go global and not just the ones that get permission to. And unless they're more transparent, there'll be backlash. So a truly private Chinese company would find it much easier to compete uh, on the global stage and to make M&A um, than a state-owned firm or state-backed firm because of the backlash from state money using, used to make those investments. But they're not at a stage where they've really decided what they're going to do on that front. And I think at some point they will have to because the private firms in China have clearly been the engines of growth, but they have certainly struggled under the current system. Um, I just have one question. You mentioned earlier that um, securities are moving in tandem and it's been very much a macro market. Assuming X number of years time, we do have a financial system in the world where we have large blocks, the US, the Eurozone, Southeast Asia, China, India. Do you think that is a thing that could continue? Um, not necessarily. I think the reason why you get um, markets moving on macro signals is because of a great deal of uncertainty. So if you have a stagnant economy, which you currently have in the West, and growth rates in the emerging world, which are likely to be dragged down, because even though these economies won't have recessions like the West, they're also not growing out. The chart I showed you about industrial production suggests it's pretty flat. Um, in this kind of environment, it's a lot of the direction in terms of growth or, uh, or, or tightening depends on policy. And this is why you get macro factors moving markets, because if you, are, uh, if you think that growth is going to be driven by QE3, and all of a sudden you know, the Fed's uh, president, uh, you know, Fisher, says no QE3, then the market falls. <laughs> um, or I'm going to solve the euro crisis, or the ECB is not going to do the next ELTRO, next, no more three-year loans after next week. That's actually what moves it. So when you have that kind of environment, uh, people tend to worry much more about how the macro environment affects the prospects of companies rather than the fundamentals of the companies themselves because the conditions are just not brilliant. But given that we're going to be stagnant for several years, it's not clear to me whether or not we can escape the kind of bear market rallies that we had in the 70s, which is a very similar period of high inflation driven by policy, very stagnant recovery, bubble oil price shocks, the whole lot. And the market essentially went through what we're seeing now, which is bear markets over one period. And all of a sudden you get a bull market, all of a sudden you get another bear market. So they're called bear market rallies. And the fundamentals don't drive investment during this time. But given that we know that, and we know that there are very, very strong companies based on fundamentals and earnings, it's not clear to me why we would want to repeat what happened 40 years ago, um, given that there are very strong. I mean, in fact, the corporate earnings story is the underappreciated story in markets because people tend to sell off based on risk on, risk off, as opposed to you know, seeing the fact that actually, because there's still strong growth drivers within markets and uh, the emerging world in particular, but also in the recovering United States and Germany and other places, that there are actually companies that do very well in this environment. So, but it's hard to be a contrarian, <laughs> as you know, investing in markets. So, I mean, but that's, you know, so my guess is the markets will be moved a lot by, you know, risk on risk off attitudes. Um, and that tends to happen in periods of uncertainty. Um, but if you can find the kind of stocks that beat that, then you know, there's always scope for that, I think. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Um, if everybody could make their way through to Rainy Hall after this, I just have one or two things to quickly say first. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who made today and the whole of this week possible. So um, Alison Marcus over at UTIC and Matt and Robbie over at EconSoc, uh, to Mark and Thomas as well, uh, but mainly today to Linda. And uh, I believe we have a small, small wee favour for you to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.